So three months ago, I get a call from Rand, and he says, hey, buddy, uh, Mel, could you speak at the conference? I said, what conference? He said, the reunion. So I'm thinking, and I go, what am I going to be talking about? He said, shaping the future. I said, shaping what? I said, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't know what you're talking about. He said, no, you have some good stories, so it'll be good. And I went to sleep that night. And I thought a little bit about it, and I thought, you know what, i got to get out of this thing. There's too much going on. Of course, the next morning, I'm getting text messages and emails from all kinds of friends over here saying, congrats, I see that you're on the program. <laughs> this guy had called me, didn't tell me that I was in the program. So the story I'm telling myself as an IL peer <laughs> was he either had me on the program and he forgot to tell me because... <laughs> I was such a good friend that I'm going to do it, or he was, I was a just the last minute replacement. So, <laughs> either way, guys, you got me, and Rand, thank you. Happy to share. So, we've heard some amazing stories, and we all have stories. The last two days have been very inspiring. And stories that we have that have events that shape us, break us, or even transform us. And today, I'd like to share with you part of my story that spans about 15 years or 11 years, that has three events, or as I call, three S-curves. And so my first S-curve started when I decided to give a shot at becoming an entrepreneur. I had just come back from London from business school and had been working for a year at a large corporation and realized that working in the corporate world was not for me. And I saw an opportunity in the healthcare industry, an industry that I've never worked in, and I thought I wanted to give a shot, so quit my job, and I partnered with a friend who I also went to SMU with, who I knew socially, but neither of us knew how we worked, what our values were, but he too had got his MBA, so we thought we could make this work. So we started writing a business plan, because we needed to raise funds because we didn't have any funds of our own. And I remember talking to one of the shareholders or, or, or an investor at first, though, and he asked us, have you guys started a company before? I said, no. And do you have any experience other than going to a doctor in this healthcare industry? I said, no. And they said, why should we invest? He said, well, because there's a great opportunity and you'll miss out if you don't. So we were pretty convincing and we get funded. And the first part of it was really fun because we're excited, we're entrepreneurs, but it felt like this, like rolling up a, a rock up a hill. It was challenging because we were just trying to figure out things on our own, and we had so many doors shut on us. But about two years in, things were starting to roll. We were getting profitable, we were making money, and then I'm going out, and I made this girl. A Texan, it's pretty, seemed like a lot of fun. And before too late, I'm starting to date her and I'm looking around. My friends are all getting married, my cousins are getting married. I thought this must be the thing to do. So, although I saw some red flags go off, I jumped in and I was now married. Now, check this out. When I was in business school, I learned that the probability of success for a startup was about 10%. So I knew that I had to really work hard and battle it out. But I had no idea what it would take to be married as an entrepreneur. And if I had to plot it, this is what it would look like. <laughs> I couldn't make it even smaller. One year into my marriage, my wife didn't really understand what it is to be, to be married to an entrepreneur who is working all the time. And my business partner and I, although the company started growing, we started clashing because the direction we wanted to take the company was different from mine to his. And what I was really doing was building a house of cards. And I felt like the business had dysfunctional partners or leadership, and my marriage had misaligned 
partners or life partners. And I remember that I felt like I had no place to escape because my work as well as home was, life was really, really unhappy. And I remember that I was praying one day and saying, how could I get out of this situation so I could be happy again? And it's interesting how prayers do get answered. Not long after, my wife came to me and said, look, I want out. I want a divorce. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, this must be the thing that I want. And this must be the right thing because I didn't want to be in this relationship. But I felt like it was a huge, huge blow to my ego. I felt like a failure. I had felt like I was going to be another statistic of a failed marriage. And at the same time, I said, you know what, I need to get out of this business partnership and looked at all the options. And I was looking through this and saw that I have a, uh, a buy-sell agreement in place with a no non-compete. So I thought, you know what, I can buy this guy out. So I started looking at the finances. And more I looked into it, I saw some finances that were not right. So I confronted my business partner and said, look, let me know what's going on. And he said, give me three weeks. And during this time, I was still the majority shareholder had about 54% of the shares, and I thought I could fire this guy if he doesn't give me the right answers. Of course, three weeks later, three weeks comes by pretty quick, I go see him, expecting him not having answers, and he gives me a, a letter of termination. And I was the CEO, how did this happen? Well, two weeks prior, I had made the biggest mistake in my life as an entrepreneur. One of my friends who was in the board said he has to divest his shares because his company that he was working for had a conflict of him owning healthcare shares in a healthcare company. And rather than me buying those shares, I bought it into the company, and the shares became treasury shares, and suddenly he had the majority shares in the company. And the next thing he did was he put his dad in the board and fired me. And 10 days later, my divorce was going through. So within a span of about two weeks, I lost my business partner, I lost my, my uh, life partner, and lost my company. And to make things worse, I had, as part of my settlement with my wife, I didn't know that I was going to get fired before, I was going to su support her for the next two years, or fund her for the next two years. So now my entire savings was gone, and I was dead broke. And if you had a low point in your life, this was it. And fortunately for me, I had my brother. Uh, he called me up and said, hey, I know you don't have a place to live. Why don't you move in with me to my place? And the two of us said, look, the only way you can get out of this situation is to try to buy your partner out again. So we started putting a pitch deck together and trying to raise funds. And that exercise was really interesting because that was like trying to sell a house and not letting somebody go in and take a look in, inside because I didn't get all the access to the finances. But we were battling through that. But in three months, I suddenly got a message saying that we have a board meeting. Now, I was still part of the board. I was a lame duck board member. And I knew something bad was going to happen. But what I did was, before we could raise all the funds to the level I wanted, I triggered the buy-sell. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to, to get a five-year severance in case I bought him and fired him. But fortunately, I got bought out. So suddenly, within about four months, I was out of my relationship and I was out of my company. And this quote kind of summarized the way I felt. There's nothing that cleanses your soul like getting the hell kicked out of you. That's exactly how I felt. And I had a six-year S-curve, and now, as Rand was talking about, I just got pushed into my second one. And when I reflect back, I realize that the reason that my partnerships failed or broke down is because I had misalignment in values. And I also realized that I didn't even understand my own values, so I knew that I needed to do something differently. And fortunately for, for me, I didn't have a non-compete, so three months later, I started my next company. But this time around, it was different. I partnered with 
with the people I trust, so my two brothers and one of my friends, Mark. And I also had more experience. I had the contacts, and of course, I had the cash. So this is a little bit different. But we also decided that everyone that we hire are going to base, be based on this values and performance curve. And you may have seen it. We want to make sure that everyone who comes in will fit the quadrant on the right. Top right would be preferable, but it's OK as long as they had the right values and the right culture. But we really made sure that nobody fit the top left, which is high performers that didn't fit our culture or values. I also changed my mindset from being a knower to a learner. And we engaged in the ILP program, so the leadership team started going in there. We had a great leadership team that we had built. We started training the people on the FLC, and the company really took off. And this is a picture of some of our leadership team. So the next eight years was a great run. Everyone was having fun. We had no debt. We had no outside investors. And by 2019, this was in 2019, we had also signed up two of the largest clients, healthcare clients that we had signed. We had hired 200 people into the company just to support them. One was a $500 million publicly traded company and a similar size P-backed company. And those companies were going live on, June, uh, on April 1st, a couple of weeks before Easter, and the other was going live on June 1st. And some of our clients decided to go to Sri Lanka, so they wanted to see what was going on with the operations. And some of my leadership team was there as well. And some of them just returned just before Easter. And then this happened. Let's see. Sri Lanka had been just attacked. Um, Sri Lanka is, was where my operations was. And they are 12 hours uh, time difference ahead. And so that Sunday morning, I get text messages and calls saying, that over 300 people have died, over 500 people have got hurt. There have been some ISIS bombers, suicide bombers, have bombed three churches and three five-star hotels. And Sri Lanka has never seen ISIS before. It was a tropical island. It was ranked number one by the Lonely Planet magazine as the, the country to visit but for tourists. And the country was com in complete chaos, and it was the 9-11 of Sri Lanka. And this is some images of what it looked like. On the left are some of the churches, and, and some of the, on the right are some of the hotels. And one of the first things that I did was that day is to check on my family. I checked to see whether Suri, who's here, whether he's OK. And he had been to church with his family, but fortunately, it was not one of these churches. My mom had uh, made reservations at one of the five-star hotels to go with the rest of the family for Easter brunch. But fortunately for us, that restaurant did get blown up, but it was two hours prior. So things could have been very, very different. And the bottom right is the Shangri-La Hotel. This is where our clients were staying at, and that's the restaurant that had been blown up. And they were there till two days before that. So talk about kick getting kicked out of an S-curve. Uh, my eight years was done, and we were just forced into a new one. And the next 24 hours, how we were going to act was going to be critical. Our clients were watching us to see whether we can perform, because everything that we did or not do was going to impact their cash flow. Our staff was looking at us to see whether we were going to be spinning out of control in a drama triangle, whether we were going to be victims, whether we were going to come through with with strength, or whether we are going to be calm. So the leadership team huddled, and we contacted our clients that Sunday, let them know what was going on. And what was really interesting was the country was, had a lockdown and curfew. We as a company had set up disaster recovery locations if a building went down, but we didn't have a work from home operation or the infrastructure in fact, we didn't even have the approval from our clients to connect from home because we are dealing with healthcare, protected healthcare information. But we went through this for the next three weeks, and then things got a little bit bad again because two of our general managers who were running our operations decided to quit. One decided to migrate overseas, the other one 
with UC health, health issues, decided to resign. But we said, you know what, we can keep going. And then the next thing we know is a month later, our vice president of operations, who was 44 years age, of, of age, got a stroke and was never able to come back to work again. And suddenly, we are forced to adapt. And so over the next six months, we decided we need to transform our operation. We need to transform our infrastructure so that we'll be ready for something like this. We have to be able to work from home if we have to. Little did we know that we were preparing for the pandemic. And this was in when March came along, two months into the pandemic, we saw Italy getting shut down, and we saw the US starting to shut down some of the airports. Sri Lanka had about 20 people that they had diagnosed with COVID, so we thought it was pretty peaceful. But we said we didn't want to get caught being forced to do something. So on a Monday, we decided to move 500 people to work from home. So we started transporting computers, equipment, screens, because not everybody could work, from, work on laptops. And by Friday, we had moved everybody. And unannounced, on that day, Sri Lanka, the government, imposed a lockdown that lasted three months, and we were fully operational. So the next year and a half for us, during the pandemic, especially at the beginning, the, our clients were, and clients and the healthcare industry was completely hit. They didn't have the infrastructure either to work from home, and even the people didn't want to come back to work, and which was a huge opportunity for us. And the company grew 80%. We added 300 people into the organization. And these are some of the awards we, we got or we received during that time. We made it to the Inc. 5000 again, and the great place to work organization awarded us multiple awards, including top 40 company in Asia, as well as uh, best places to work for women and, and millennials. And of course, our partners, these are the partners in the picture here, my two brothers and Mark, who called himself the brother from the other mother who had a little bit of a less tan. <laughs> and uh, we huddled and we said, look, you know, the leadership team all have been working from home and that we should get together We've had two and a half years of a battle. We should celebrate. We should also start planning. And this was during the summer. So we decided to come, get together on July 15th. And some of the team members flew in. And on July 12th, I got the call that I didn't want to get. My business partner, Mark, had taken his own life. This was a huge shock to us because he had had some health issues before, but for the last three years, he had been in complete remission. But unfortunately, it seems that some of the medication he was taking for his anxiety and depression got the better of him. And this made me very sad because he's not part of this organization anymore, but it also got me angry that I couldn't stop this. It was a huge hit to the company, but more than that, it was a huge hit to me personally, because he was a guy who was there as a friend and partner when I was going through a rough time. And while I should have been celebrating with him, I had to deliver his eulogy, which was one of the hardest things I had to do. And this whole event, made me think about life. You know, how, sh how should you, you know, what should be your priority? You know, we should not be taking things for granted. How much gratitude that we should have for people, uh, people who are around us, and that we should take, not take life for granted in a way that we are not connecting with the people we care about, especially friends and family and the people that you work with. It also made, reminded me that we are not immortal. You know, the, we think about things like this happen to other people, but it happened to me. And it also made me remember that I should live my life more based on my purpose and my core values, and that I should not be living every day like it's Groundhog Day, every day going, doing the same thing over and over again. 
And most of all, it made me re realize that I should be present around my family, my friends, and the people I care about. So talking about family, this is my wife on, on the left. Uh, I met her at a charity event, and we've been married seven years. And she uh, served in the Navy, and she's also a real surfer. So you can see this picture. It's not in California, it's in Sri Lanka. She's an Ironman triathlete, and she loves that the fact that I'm an entrepreneur. And in fact, she's also a co-founder of a baby monitor product that we're going to launch sometime next year in our other company. And on the right are my two daughters, Ellie, who just turned three last week, and Lily, who just turned five two weeks ago. The best part of it is they tell me that they love me about 10 times a day, and they think I'm the greatest. But of course, Rand blew my bubble a little bit because he said based on his experience with his two teenage daughters that I should expect an S-curve in about, <laughs> <laughs> about eight to 10 years. But while you figure that out, Rand, I'm gonna enjoy this ride, okay? So as I wrap things up, you know, I think that who we are today is part that has been shaped from the past and part from what we have transformed ourselves to be in the future. And there's this quote that I would love to read that Steve Jobs talks about, that, that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, or whatever. I also would add to that that you cannot do this alone. I think that you have to have faith, you gotta have your family, and you have to have your friends, and that community that I think Vid was talking about. So the next time you guys are going through a rough time or surfing that S-curve of life, think of yourself as this guy who's surfing this giant wave in Hawaii. You may come through this unscathed, or you could crash and burn. But either way, if you can live to tell the story, it's worth it, because you could tell that you're transformed, and you're shaped for the future, and you made it. Thank you. Thank you.